Hey everyone, hello and welcome to the Buds and Blue Jays YouTube show. I'm your host, Jesse Burrell. I'm joined by my co-host, Riley McConnell. Riley, what's going on, man? Not much. Episode number two. Um, mm -hmm. Episode one went well. Um, it's going to be fun, man. Uh, I really enjoyed myself last week. I'm glad you renewed my contract and uh, <laughs> had me back. Yeah, of course. I can't help but notice you have a nice new setup back there. What's that all about? Yeah, so um, actually, since it went so well, I decided to go out, um, get a new poster, yeah. um, get a nice spanking new set of headphones. Hopefully the audio comes out a little bit better in the first week and uh, yeah. called it uh, Riley's New Studio. Why don't you give the guys a little uh, caption down there, uh, Riley's New Studio. <laughs> Perfect. We'll do Look, that. Looks, looks good, man. Looks good. <laughs> It almost looks like we know what we're doing now, eh? Yeah, yeah. Try to keep uh, <laughs> keep as professional as possible, dude. All right, perfect. Well, so today on the show, we're going to continue our Meet the Blue Jays team segment. Uh, in this episode, we're going to go through all the pitchers that should be infecting the team in 2022. Uh, we're going to go through the rotation. We're going to talk about a lot of relievers. If you're looking for anything hitter-related, we did all that in our first episode. I would recommend going back and checking that out. Maybe you can learn a cool new thing or two and tell you what our upside about Alejandro Kirk could be. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, we're also going to talk about some Hall of Fame talk. Um, as we just saw the votes go out yesterday, Riley and I both filled out our ballot. So we're going to share that. We're going to talk about that and what this could mean for the Hall of Fame going future. But before we get into that, um, we want to give everyone a huge shout out and support for all the ovations that we got on our first episode. You know, we weren't really sure what to expect, but all the nice comments we got from our friends and family and from people who have various amounts of baseball knowledge, it, it felt so good to hear. And it showed that you know, what we were doing wasn't for vain and that people actually are interested in this type of stuff. So I don't know about you, but that got me really excited to keep going and to keep pushing this further. Yeah, man, it's it's good to read all the positives, man. Mm -hmm. um, if people would come out and uh, real cutthroat like, I, I think we'd still go out and do it. But everything I read was positive. Uh, people interacting on on Twitter, YouTube, yep. on Facebook. Uh, it's all it's all real good stuff to read, you know. Um, a lot of Oh, this could make me a new big Jays fan stuff. That's awesome. We <laughs> want to read that. You know, we want to grow the Blue Jays community, um, you know, anywhere we can. So reach out, tell your friends about it. And if you like it, keep watching. If you don't like it, then, you know, there's other things you can be doing. But just two guys talking about baseball. And if you enjoy that stuff, follow us all season mm -hmm. long. Yeah, I've got to be that classic YouTube host guy. But we're going to tell you to like and subscribe and all that uh, all that fun stuff. So you ready to uh, ready to get into it? Yeah, let's dive into some pitchers here. Um, right. Just before yeah. we do that first, though, um, everyone wants to know if we got the answer to last week's trivia question right before we do that. And so last week I asked you, with Jose Bautista, or not Jose Bautista, with uh, Vlad Jr. finished second place in MVP voting, if you could name the last uh, Toronto Blue Jay to finish second place in MVP voting. Do you remember what your answer was? Of course I remember. It was Carlos Delgado. Mm. So great choice. We had a couple of comments in the YouTube page. We had a couple of answers coming through our Twitter feed. We had someone guess Fred McGriff, which I thought was a pretty good guess in the early 90s there. He had some good years. Uh, a lot of people thought Jose Bautista in the 2010 and 2011 season. But Riley, man, you nailed it. You're too good for trivia. Carlos Delgado was indeed the answer. Um, and I think the year you gave was 2003. I wasn't even mm -hmm. thinking 2003. I was thinking somewhere in around 2001. So if you were to ask me the year, I definitely would have got that one wrong. Yeah, he finished second place to uh, Alex Rodriguez, who, you know, that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dang, um, A-Rod. Yeah. We'll uh, throw another trivia question at, towards you at the end of this show, so stay tuned and uh, get excited for that. Now, without that interruption, we can get into pitching. So I'm going to give you some rundown on how the Jays were in 2011. So the Jays finished 10th in baseball with a 3.91 ERA. Uh, they were 7th in Major League Baseball in, stri in strikeout percentage. They were 6th in walk percentage. It doesn't really matter what statistic you look at. The Jays kind of finished between 7th in the majors and 15th in the majors. So they were an above average pitching staff on basically anywhere you looked. Um, and they should be better in 2022 we'll get into that as we go um yeah but i think before we start talking about what their new rotation is going to look like in 22 i think we have to talk about robbie ray and what robbie ray was for this team last year like the guy literally was dominant as i saw as i know you saw as i'm sure some of our viewers saw out there that i mean he won the cy young award as the award for the best pitcher in baseball like i don't think you can get much better how do you think this team's going to look without Robbie Ray this year? 
I think it's uh, I think it's going to look a lot of the same, to be honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, I think our offense can carry this team a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to down our pitching, of course. Um, this is definitely a um, offensively gifted squad. Um, and we do have some very good pitchers, some very good young pitchers. Um, adding a veteran to the team and uh, the return of another veteran pitcher, a good left-hander too. Um, our bullpen, yes, it does need some work. And as the season goes on, we'll see how these guys do. Um, as far as the pitchers they have now, I think everything should be set um, to start the year off. Yeah, and I don't want to rule out the possibility of the Jays going out and adding more pitching too, as I'm sure we'll touch on in another episode as we get to the season that – uh, the guys we talk about here today might not be the same guys that are on this team on the opening day or even, hell, if the lockout ends soon, three weeks from now, like, who knows? Um, look, losing Robbie Ray, though, is going to hurt. Like, the guy won a Cy Young Award. He was the best pitcher in the, Amer- in the American League. It doesn't matter who you sign. You're not going to be able to replace that. But as we get into some of the players here, I think it's going to be, like you said, a lot closer than you think. And I think um, some of the arms that we've got in here can actually be pretty good. So you want to get into the first guy here that we're going to talk about? Um, the guy who is supposed to be our quote-unquote ace for this upcoming season in uh, Kevin yeah. Gosman? Yeah, absolutely, man. We'll uh, go with Gosman. Um, I want to start this off before I before I say, I didn't tell you about this, Jesse, but I'm mm-hmm. very strongly opinionated about this. And that's okay. the difference between, between pitching in the American League to pitching in the National League. You All rule right. out the pitcher versus the DH. So Kevin Gosman had a career year last year. We both know that. The MLB knows knows that. He's coming to Toronto um, with some big shoes to fill, we'll say, to replace Robbie Ray. Is he going to give us Cy Young numbers? We don't know. But hopefully we have a good season out of him. Um, He had 227 strikeouts last year and a 104 whip. Mm -hmm. Dominant numbers. Dominant numbers numbers he's a over a strikeout in inning kind of guy and he's not walking a ton of guys either and when you combine those two things you're already setting yourself up for success the idea Mm -hmm. obviously being to strike the batter out and not walk him and I think our defense is just just good enough to back him up and keep that whip low that's uh what's going to be the main thing because one of the main things about Robbie Ray is uh when when Robbie Ray was here and pitching his Cy Young Award season last year, when a batter got on base, Robbie Ray was the best in baseball at stranding that runner by keeping him on base by over like 7% over the next guy. So, you know, part of that is probably to do with our defense that was behind him, but it was also probably to do with, hey, Robbie Ray was just really good at striking out batters. Now, Kevin Gosman is also really good at, um, at doing just that. His strikeout rate was also quite up there. He did a lot of really good things. And um, I'm going to give you a quick little rundown here about him. He's 31 years old. So we just signed him to a five-year, $110 million contract in the offseason. He has four pitches, but he mostly just throws his fastball splitter. His fastball will sit about 95 miles per hour, but his splitter is his his go-to pitch. Now, you talked about um, pitching in the AL and how it's different than pitching in the NL. Yeah, you know, facing the pitcher twice in a game does kind of help. You know, you're not facing a tough DH every time. So the lineups are a little thicker in here. And that's going to be a, just a little extra added challenge for Gosman. But Gosman has pitched in the American League and the American League East before. Now, when he was with the Orioles, he wasn't nearly as good as the, he had with the Giants. So obviously, I'd like to think he's a different pitcher now. But it's he's done it before. So that little bit of experience should help him as he's coming over to Toronto this year. Yeah, he uh, he did get lit up at the American League East. I was reading some numbers that um, are not Kevin Gosman last year. Like, um, st- still um, over his career, he still holds a whip of one one two eight. If you can yeah. believe it, so he actually wasn't as bad as people think. Yes, ERAs are going to be higher, especially in the American League East, but he does a very good job at limiting getting limiting guys getting on base uh, on mm-hmm. his side. Which, obviously, your goal as a pitcher is to try to get 27 outs as quick as you can. And if guys aren't getting on base, that's huge. Kevin Gosman should still be one of the best of that. Now, I know the Jays have had interest in Gosman before. So before this year, he was going to be a free agent as well. And the Jays had a lot of interest in Kevin Gosman. But he turned them down and ultimately signed a qualifying offer with San Francisco. So that way, it didn't really surprise me when um, San Francisco didn't offer him a new contract that the Jays jumped all over it. 
the Jays see something in Kevin Gosman and they've wanted him for years now. And so I think that speaks in good volume that the Jays have actually kind of done really well at their player selection and who they get from free agents and trades and stuff to come on this team. So that gives me a lot of hope that Kevin Gosman could still be really good. Um, he might not be Robbie Ray levels, but if you're asking for someone to be a Cy Young Award winner, that's kind of tough to do. Yeah, you could never ask a pitcher at the start of the year, at any point in the year, and say, hey, I need you to put up Cy Young numbers because we don't know how the next guy's going to go. We don't know how guys like Garrett Cole are going to pitch this year. You can't ask things of that for pitchers. Um, what you can ask is just to go out and obviously pitch, pitch just the best he can. Um, you know, even if he does give up, you know, four, four runs here, three and a half here, goes out and blows up a seven spot. You know, I feel like our offense can really hold a lot of these, uh, a lot of these pitchers, man. And I don't think that's going to be a problem with Gosman. I think he's going to keep his numbers quite low this year. Are they going to be as low as his National League numbers? Maybe not, but we don't know yet. He's, he's a really good pitcher. And the fact that he did pitch in Baltimore and we had so much interest when he went over uh, to the West Coast in San Francisco, mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do think that speaks volumes. And um, I really hope that the Jays get what they really, you know, what they paid for in Gosman. Mm -hmm. Jays are really going to need that uh, this year if they're going to be successful, if they're going to be the playoff team that we think the Jays can, Jays can be. They're going to need that from Kevin Gosman. Riley, I'm going to share some facts with you about Gosman's last season and tell me what you think about this. Shoot. So I'm, so I'm going to go uh, month by month from Gosman's season last year, telling you his ERA in each month. So okay. in April of last year, he had a 214 ERA. Awesome. Great, great yeah. pitcher. Yeah. In May, the month of May, he made six starts. He had an ERA of 0 0.73. He only gave up three earned runs a whole month. That's a lead stop. So that's, is that four or five starts there? That's six starts. He made six that's, starts in that's May. Six, six, that's on six starts. And only gave up three earned runs that whole month. So that's pretty good. In June, that's... he was good again. He had a 2.32 ERA. Then you get into July and towards the All-Star break, his ERA in July was over five. It was 5.11. Then he rebounded a bit in August to a 3.16 ERA. And then in September, it was up over four. So... Tell me how you think about this. He was dominant in the first half of the season, then kind of struggled towards the end. How does that make you feel? So I just wrote these numbers down. Uh, did he start 32 games for uh, San Francisco? I think he started 33. I don't think he missed a start. 30. Okay, so he was the top two guys. So 33 starts. Um, and you look at numbers like that, um, and out of the gates. How about a whole month, too? A sub Three-quarter ERA, a point mm -hmm. seven three. That's mm -hmm. almost unheard of. Three earned runs and six starts, like you said. Um, I mean, you don't hear about those um, of of numbers like that. That's like me playing on beginner difficulty in a video game. <laughs> um, the 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 plus five ERA though, you know, that's gonna happen. Pitchers are weird, man. They can be mm -hmm. hot one start and then cold in another. Like. Oh, yeah, you got a four-hit shutout. Or, wow, you got nailed for seven runs and two and a third. You know, things happen. But finishing the year the way he did, he bounced back from whatever that was. Um, a 316, and even if an ERA is over four, um, you see that with a lot of pitchers. He held his own in 2021. So, so you think we're going to get a lot closer to the first half of last year, Kevin Gosman, the guy who was like a mid-twos, low-threes ERA guy than the guy we got in the second half? Well, you know what I really think, Jesse? I think that 316 um, is a real good number to go off of. Okay. Um, two, 232 would be would be lovely. Um, that would be, like, I would say another Cy Young kind of number yeah. right there. Um, it, it, it's, those are really good numbers. Uh you know, three, three point two, three point three. Um, I would be over the moon with numbers like that, especially at the way at the rate he strikes guys out. Mm -hmm. um, his low whip, because um, if he does get nailed for a big ERA, it's just it's just because those uh, those runners that got on base scored, and a lot of the time that's just luck of the draw. Who's hitting behind who? Yeah, or a soft ground ball gets through the infield, or the guy bloops one off the end of the bat, right? Yeah. Um, one interesting fact is Kevin Gosman actually threw his fastball right down the middle of the plate, second most than anyone in baseball last year, but he actually had pretty good numbers on it, which is kind of surprising. So between 2021 and 2020, Gosman threw more fastballs middle middle than any other pitcher in baseball. Can you do you know who was second in baseball at throwing pitches right down the middle of the plate? Uh, I actually do. Um, is it Lance Lynn? No, it wasn't Lance Lynn. It was Robbie Ray. Uh. 
Robbie was Ray, it Robbie more, Ray? More fastballs right down the middle of the plate. Now, Robbie Ray's always had this nasty, amazing stuff. And Kevin Gosman uses his splitter that kind of travels in on the same plane of the fastball, and then the splitter just dips right down, right? So it makes that middle, middle fastball look a lot tougher. Yeah. But uh, when he was going through his tough stretch last year, he was kind of losing command of that splitter a little bit so people could really ambush that fastball. So I think that's going to be the breaking point for Kevin Gosman's season this year. If that is going well, then I think Kevin Gosman can be elite. If, you know, the location isn't there as the splitter, he could get hit a little bit. and It might be tough. We'll, we'll see. We'll be talking about Gosman a lot this season, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, we're, I'm going to be watching him with both eyes for sure. Um, you know, he's he's got a lot um, he's got a lot riding on him this year. Um, I think we're going to see more good than bad this year. Um, again, we, we're talking about this, um, so we're going to expect if he's healthy the whole year, 33 starts for Gosman. If not, 32 starts, depending mm -hmm. on if he stays healthy the whole year. Um, but I I think he can expect some pretty good numbers from Kevin Gosman this year. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. Ready yeah. to move on to the next guy? Yeah, yeah. Do you do you have the next guy picked out, or do you want me to? Well, I think the next, the next guy in our rotation is probably going to be uh, Jose Barrios. I'd say he's a right-handed yeah. pitcher, 27 years old. He's a two-time All-Star. Uh, we acquired him at the trade deadline last year for Austin Martin, who was our number one prospect, and Simeon Woods Richardson, who was a guy we acquired in the Marcus Stroman trade. Um, he pitched really well for us down the stretch last year. I was kind of surprised. I didn't know what to expect from Jose Barrios. I thought maybe he might even take a step back, but he came in here. He looked right at in. Um, he himself is even on record saying, you know, like, I love Toronto. I love the people here. And it showed because this offseason, he signed a seven-year, $131 million contract to remain with the Toronto Blue Jays. So Jose Barrios is going to be on this team into his mid-30s. Like, he's going to be here for a long, long time. This is a guy I wanted to talk about. I'm actually very surprised at you, Jesse, that you mm -hmm. expected him to take a step back. Uh, I did. Before he, came, before, before he came to Toronto, he was for sure my favorite pitcher in the AL Central. No way. Um, that's not saying much. I, I, loved, I loved his stuff, man. He's got – I mean, you'll talk about his actual pitching, but you want to talk about a guy who throws with great velocity, great control, and great movement on his breaking pitches. I mean, Barrios is your guy, and he's so young. Um, and he's not that inexperienced. He, he does have, um, you know, some years in the big leagues. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the things I got on him, besides having, I said, a, like electric stuff, uh, this fastball and curveball, I think are his uh, number one and two pitches. Um, you know, he's going to get a lot of weak contact or a lot of strikeouts with that. And he's a guy who can go 200 innings for us for sure. I mean, that, I don't know if that's a hot take at this point. But Jose Barrios is the pitcher of the future for this Toronto Blue Jays club. With that big contract being signed, I feel like he can, you know, carry the staff. Whoever comes in and out, I think that if he stays, and I hope he does, that he's going to pick up a lot of wins for us. Um, I'm not going to say set records. That's going to be blasphemous <laughs> towards Doc. Um, yeah. But he's going to be real, real good for us. Um, I think a whip anywhere in the 1.3 area is fine. And even an ERA around four to, you know, at the lowest, I don't see it too, too, too low, you know, three, five to four. And that's, those aren't even bad numbers in, in 2021 standard. Yeah, He's not I'd, an average guy. I'd still like to shoot for a little lower if I can, especially for the guy I'm paying $131 million to. Um, Jose Burrios to me has always seemed like the guy who was just one small tweak away from being an absolute ace. And for years in Minnesota, he's had good stretches of like five or six starts where he's looked really good and he's, he's uh, pitched the ball well, but he hasn't taken that one big leap. And it's year after year after year, it hasn't happened. So I was starting to really worry if, are we ever going to see that leap from Jose Barrios? But I think getting him into the Blue Jays system with Pete Walker and Pete Walker can work his magic with Jose Barrios. I really think we're actually starting to see him become even better now. And he could be that ace as he's entering his 27 year old season here. So I think, Sky's the limit for Jose Barrios, really. I mean, if you were to look at someone who could probably win a Cy Young Award in the near future, I'd almost put it over Jose Barrios than I would Kevin Gosman as someone who could be one of the best pitchers on this team. Yeah, he's, um, I won't say generational. Uh, we do have him for a long time now. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to see consistency for Barrios. Obviously, you're not wrong in saying that he's missing that one little tweak, that one little, little half step. Um, but he is a guy, If I think if he gets comfortable this year and does start the year off well, he could, you know, carry that momentum and have quite a good year. 
Um, I'd almost go as far to say that um, this year, I think that uh, Barrios could be an all-star. Yeah, he's uh, been an all-star twice already, and yeah. I, I'd almost say it's more likely than not, unless he gets hurt, of course, that he will be yeah. an all-star again this year. Yeah. I, I, I expect good numbers from him. If he goes and he's, if he does put up 200 innings, um, I expect over 200 strikeouts. You know, if he throws 210 innings, um, then maybe I think the strikeouts could be 220. You know, a little over a strikeout in inning. Yeah, his uh, you talked about his repertoire and how good he is. His fastball, he, he sits about 94, but can touch it up to 97. Uh, his horizontal movement, he gets on his curveball, so it's kind of like a big sweeping pitch. It's, I don't know if it's the best in baseball, but the amount it moves is elite. Like the yeah. amount of movement that has, it's almost more of like a big looping slurve ball. And that's why you see hitters just struggle to hit on it so much. That's his big weapon that Jose Barrios has. Um, you know, he was really good last year. He had a career low 3.5 ERA and a number was backed up in career best in strikeout rate, walk rate, and ground ball rate. So all things that add to what a pitcher can control to make him successful. Jose Barrios had the best year for all of those last year. So if those can continue again another step forward, Jose Brios could be a star for this team for the for the long term. Yeah, I don't see any steps back for Brios. Um, I really see only steps in the right direction for this guy. I mean, he's young, and at this point, I just if there's you know when hockey you get a C on your chest, I just slap the ace on his shoulder. I really do. I I think the sky's the ceiling or the you know sky's the limit for this guy. Um, you know, I expect some really good things. Um, like I said, I think he's an all-star. Um, there's a potential for a Cy Young Award at some point in his career. Hopefully it's mm -hmm. with the Jays. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be here for a long time to figure it out. So I'm with you. I'm excited to watch yeah. Jose Brios pitch this year. Me too. All right, next guy on the list, we have our rookie sensation. We have Alec Manoa. Ooh. Uh, yeah, this is a fun guy. He's a oh, yeah. right-handed pitcher. He's six foot six, 260 pounds. So He's a bulldog out there. Uh, 24 years old. He's a former first-round pick. So he's the first guy on this list who was really a guy the Blue Jays drafted, a guy that the Blue Jays took through their farm system, and they brought him up. He's under team control until 2028. So Manoa's going to be here for a long time, too. Um, he's more, as of now, just a two-pitch pitcher. He's a fastball kind of sinker slider guy, and he'll throw the odd changeup, I guess. Um, sits 93, but can touch it all the way up to 98. He's... You know, like I said, he's a bulldog. Yeah, absolute stud, absolute killer rookie season. Um, mm -hmm. If he had, I think if he had four more starts, um, you, you talk a potential rookie of the year. Um, I think the lack of, the lack of starts um, might have deterred that just a little bit. Like you said, first round, 11th overall in 2019. Yep. And we're, in, we're going into the 2022 year. Um, when you have guys coming up to the major leagues um, – from a draft that was, you know, two and a half, three years ago. That's Those are big things. A lot of guys, even first rounders, spend a lot of time um, in the minor leagues. And Manoa coming up when he did and pitching with such dominance. And I'll say dominance because mm -hmm. he really did well. Um, nine and two, 3.22 ERA and 111 innings pitch, uh, 111 and two thirds. Yeah. Well, besides um, Robbie Ray, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 120 Ks, which is more than a uh, strikeout per inning, and a whip of 105, which is just insane at any point. I, a rookie that, you know, he could have had three starts and mm -hmm. not had a whip that if, – if he had three starts and had a whip that low, that's still impressive. The fact that he pitched 20 games and had that number is sensational. Oh, it was absolutely unbelievable. And when was the last time you saw a young Blue Jays pitcher – come into this rotation, step up, and immediately hit the ground running. It's Honestly, been a long time. Aaron Sanchez, I, maybe? Mike Stroman? Jesse Litch. It's <laughs> been a long time. <laughs> like, dude, yeah. it's been a long time since we've had that, you know, that young, homegrown guy. I'd love to see it, man. I, I, love, I love a farmed guy, especially one we've drafted. Um, mm -hmm. He's, he's going to be awesome, man. I'd love to see what he does over the course of a full season. I got a lot riding on this kid. I really do. Are you worried at all about um, a sophomore slump from Alec Manoa? Do you believe in the sophomore slump? Uh, baseball is a game of superstitions, Jesse. And <laughs> really I had, I, you know, I had mine growing up from playing the game. Um, I had a couple, you know, 
I could have gone a couple weeks, <clears throat> um, not house league ball. I mean, house league ball was one thing, but going and playing high school ball, mm -hmm. um, you go out and you have a couple weeks where, you know, you hit really poorly. You know, I never pitched, thank, thank God. Um, <laughs> but if me as a position player at the plate, um, you know, you think, you know, is, is this, is this going to end or is this just me? Is this right. just me? Um, at some point though, you snap out of it. Uh, I think for Manoa, I think the confidence is, is there. Now the, the, the problem with, uh, being confident is you don't want to get overconfident. Yeah. You don't want to be cocky. Right. Uh, you, you're right. And I, and I think the one maybe knock on him, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm not saying it's a bad personality. But I think he's the kind of guy, being a young young guy with with great numbers, um, you you see him get involved last year in some confrontation. I think that's great. Love the passion. I love I love that he's he's a huge guy. Uh, ain't no one gonna knock him down. But as far as the sophomore slump goes, yeah, maybe his numbers aren't gonna be as good as last season's. But I think you know this is a good sample size of what we could potentially be getting out of out of Alec Manoa. Yeah, if Alec Manoa is kind of the guy that we showed in his rookie year, and that's just who he is, he's going to be up there. And the Jays might have one of the best rotations in baseball, if that is what Alec Manoa could be. Um, you do like his energy. You like his passion. We've seen a lot of passionate pitchers um, from the Blue Jays in the past year. Um, and it's been good. So I'd like to see a little more of that as we go. Uh, he's got a really good friendship with Hunjin Ryu, actually. And Ryu is like kind of the, the, uh, the veteran on this team. That's going to calm guys like Manoa down and kind of get him to channel his emotions and stuff. So you kind of like seeing that. And he was on the Jeff Blair show probably about a week or two ago saying that Alec Manoa has been in touch with Kevin Gosman a lot so far this offseason. And Gosman's actually teaching Alec Manoa how to throw his splitter. So if Alec Manoa can add a splitter to this repertoire that's already pretty good, I think that just increases the upside. And Alec Manoa can be even better in 2022 than he was in 2021. If he could develop that other that next pitch, I mean, a lot of guys start out throwing three pitches, and then as they move on in their careers, later in their careers, um, they start to you know develop uh, kind of a knack for maybe throwing more pitchers. But if you're 24, 25 years old and learning to master these different pitches that differentiate mm -hmm. so much from you know that primary breaking pitch, if you incorporate that split finger um, into your repertoire of pitches, you know. Um, you're really going to, you know, for one, improve your strikeout rate because he already has a great K rate. Um, and just all along the board, you're going to improve your numbers. Yeah. And again, we talked about Gosman and Burrios and stuff. I think Alec Manoa might be one of the more guys, like the fun guys on this team that you just sit and watch and you can actively enjoy just how he can make hitters look so foolish at such a young age. So I'm really excited to see Alec Manoa pitch in 2022. And sky's the limit. Let's hope he can get that. Sky's the limit. I loved watching him last year, and I'm going to love watching him again this year, man. All right. Well, we go from all the great and nice things in the Blue Jays rotation. we got to talk about Hunjin Ryu. Yes, Hunjin we, Ryu. <laughs> yes we do. Uh, 34 years old. He's, a, he's our first left-handed pitcher that we're getting so far. He's uh, into now year three of his four-year $80 million contract that we gave him. Look, when we got this guy out of L.A., he was dominant when he pitched in L.A., and in 2022, in the COVID-shortened season, he was amazing again. He was just the guy we expected. He was, he was phenomenal. Um, Hanjin Ryu isn't a lot like the other guys on here who are all hard throwers, power slider guys. Hanjin Ryu is a lot more of the soft tosser. He throws six different pitches, and he relies a lot more on his command than he does with blowing your pitches by you. Um, he doesn't walk guys, which is a big plus, because, you know, if the guys are going to make contact against you, you can't intentionally put base runners on. Um, you know, his, he started out 2021 really well. He did really good. And then as the season went on, he kind of wore down. Now, you can look at his certain pitches and say, well, his changeup, which is his bread and butter, wasn't as effective in 2021. His cutter was just missing the spots a lot more. And when he got hit, Hunjin Ryu got hit real hard last year. He got, um, I think it was like the 11th hardest hit pitcher in all of baseball last year, qualified pitcher maybe. So that's not good. If you're relying on your control and your control's not there, you could be in a lot of trouble. And that's what I think happened to Hanjin Ryu in 2021. Yeah, if you talk about pitchers and you talk about three different things that makes a pitcher good, and that's velocity, movement, and control. And I ranked them the way I did there because I think if you're a pitcher with the highest velocity, 
you're going to be more successful than the next guy with movement. I think your control guy, it's the hardest kind of, or the hardest type of pitcher to be is that guy who throws low velo, has good control because you're not going to get those strikeouts. Um, you're going to be a guy who's known as uh, the ground ball pitcher. You know, you're going to have to rely on your defense a little bit more. Um, yeah. And usually, usually, Jesse, so that number scares me when you said 11th. Um, is that AL or just MLB? I think that's league-wide. Now, that might only yeah. be qualified pitchers, so guys who had enough innings to qualify, but uh, yeah. still, we oh, yeah. hit very hard. Yeah, and then that's the problem because usually the the control guys are, I, as I consider them, the, um, the ground ball pitchers, usually those are the kind of guys that give up weak weaker contact mm -hmm. um, when there is bad on ball. So when you see things like that, you see, because I'm sure that number has been spiked from years prior. Uh, it has to be. Uh, there's no way he's given up um, numbers like that in the past. But um, yeah. going to be a bounce back you for Ryu. Um, that would be nice to see. Yeah, the one thing I do want to say about Ryu is that he has been on record saying that starting the season in Dunedin and, and then having to go to Buffalo and then coming into Rogers Center to play his games was really hard for him. He had a young son that he wasn't able to see, and uh, he had like he wasn't able to see his family for extended periods of times. And for what we know of Ryu, he very much is like a family-oriented guy. He, he takes care of his own. He likes those things. So I don't want to say maybe that that affected him on the field. But if you're a guy who needs to be in the right mental headspace in order to make your pitches, you know, be as like where you need them to go. If you're not in the right mental space, that could really be putting off from you. And now that they're hopefully going to be allowed to play in Toronto again, that he can be with his family. I think that is optimism that Ryu could get his focus back and that he could be the same guy he was in 2020. Well, at this point, when you talk about rotations in in um, in the 2020s era, um, you know the past three seasons, you need a lefty in your lineup. Um, yes, you can't you can't just have hard throwing right handers. It's not you know 1986 anymore um, when guys were throwing their blazing 95 mile an hour fastballs or whatever back then. Um, you know, for this Jays team to be, um, you know, at the top of this division or in the top two, Ryu's really got to be on this year. Um, sadly, other things too, he's never pitched um, 200 innings in a season. He's not a guy that, you know, really goes the distance a whole lot, you know, se seven innings and a, hopefully a quality start. And then he's kind of leaving it up to the pen. Mm -hmm. um, in his years with the Dodgers, that was always the thing. When he was playing, he was really good, but he got hurt a lot. Um, and didn't. But in 2020, he pitched a full season, albeit that was the COVID shortened season, and that yeah. was only two months. So I don't know. Yeah. That is also the big knock on Ryu is that he does get hurt. I find he also, if he starts to feel something, he will take himself out of the game so he doesn't let it get worse, where we've seen other pitchers kind of push themselves and go through it. So that can be a good thing because I guess you want to avoid any long term injuries, but it kind of feels bad when he only pitches two innings in a start, feels something a little tight, and then he ends up missing two weeks before he gets back out there. It's you know, it, it's tough sometimes. Uh, Jesse, the, um, usually you ask me the questions. I got one for you. Could you okay. see um, – there's there's two ways the season could go for Ryu, um, and that's obviously um, being the shortened season um, Hunjin Ryu, which would be amazing to see because we would get some really good um, numbers out of him. We would, oh, see his, we would see his change up going. We would see him give up weak contact and our infield work their magic um, the way we know they can. But – you know, is he a guy that could get replaced in this lineup? Uh, I think as long as Hunjin Ryu is there is there is another left. Sorry, I just uh, there is another lefty in this lineup. Won't say too much about him, but um, obviously Ryu is gonna be you know st gonna be starting. And like you said, with the thing with age, you know, um, in, in my opinion, he's kind of starting for you know his his job. He's he's got to be good. I think Ryu, be, just because he's the veteran and that he's been around and he's shown that he's done it before, he's going to get quite a long leash. And I feel like if he has an extended period, like a five, six start stretch where he doesn't look that good, he doesn't get effective, I think the Jays might try to find a phantom injury, if you will, to put him on the DL for a while so we can try to figure it out before they bring him back in and really try to get it to go. But if, if Ryu is healthy and he is going, I think Montoyo is really going to, to ride with him, kind of sink or swim with the guy. Because just because you know how good he can be when the thing's working, it'll be it'll be fun to watch as we get going through the season. Yeah, again, hoping good things for Ryu, um, a healthy Ryu, two thumbs up for him. Mm -hmm. um, and some, if 
you know, if there is the nagging injuries, if there is the inflated earn runs and everything like that, then, you know, like you said, I hope uh, Montoya can um, kind of sort that out with them and, you know, make it work. We're like, we're really going to need our pitchers to be on for this to work. Pitching is half the game. Yeah. And it's the thing the Jays have struggled with for a long time. So I'm this as long as I can remember, Jesse. Yeah. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a tough episode to do, man. It really is. I don't want to, don't want to, um, you know, knock guys too hard, but I'm, I'm going to be hard on Ryu. And if, I, and if Barrios goes out and has an awful three starts a year, you know, I'll be hard on him too. I just, Different expectations for different guys. I mean, expectations are high for this team. We think the Jays are going to be really good, right? So, therefore, oh, cer cer certainly, yes, yeah. certainly. I got to go. Um, one good thing about Ryu, though, before we move on to the next guy, is there's already reports that he is going to Korea to train with some of the KBO teams while um, the MLB is in lockout. So, I think it's good that Ryu is already at the end of January here. He's already getting into training mode, he's already trying to put his best step forward to get prepared for the 2022 season. And I think you'd rather hear that than rather hear a guy just sitting at home, right? Just working in the gym by himself, right? So it sounds like he's determined to get better and wants to be that guy in 2022. So let's hope it uh, pans out. The guy obviously loves baseball. So that's, I saw you uh, had that on Twitter. Yeah. And um, I kind of smiled at it because at, at that point, I think I was thinking more uh, lesser thoughts about him. But not all thoughts are bad about Hunjin mm -hmm. Ryu. I just, I really hope he does well. Um, yes, his leash might be long, but for me, my patience might be shorter than maybe some of the other starters on this team. Hey, I'm sure we'll talk about it as the season goes yeah, on. He's going to be one sure. of the interesting For guys sure, guys. Jesse. Um, so who do you got think is going to be the Toronto Blue Jays' fifth starter coming out of this? Okay, season? I'm glad, I'm glad you kind of asked me because, uh, I think there's three guys that you can go with potentially, right? Okay. I mean, two or three. Um, so Ross Stripling. Yep. Ryan Barucki. Okay. Uh, Trent Thornton. Sure. Um, and I have all those guys labeled on the MLB, uh, MLB staff, whether they're a starter long out of the pen. In a AAA, um, I have Pearson, Nate Pearson, and Anthony Kay. Okay. Um, we should mention that St this was Stephen Matt's job in 2021. Um, who didn't really do that great to start, but he got on a good roll of about two and a half months there, um, which landed him a three-year contract with uh, the Cardinals. And apparently the Mets were so pissed about that, they got all mad and signed um, Max Scherzer. So it's amazing what three months of Steven Matz has caused chaos, uh, chaos for the rest of the MLB. Um, I personally think that it's going to be, well, I think the Jays are going to sign somebody, first of all. I don't think um, anyone on their current roster is going to start the season in that fifth starter spot. However, if it is one of these guys in the roster, I think it's going to be Ross Stripling's job to start. Just because he's got, like, the veteran edge. And I, I haven't looked at options, but I think Barucki and uh, Thornton do still have options. And plus, I know in Thornton's case, he really wasn't that good last year. I'd say make him prove it in Buffalo before you bring him up here. Um, and Ryan Barucki, I kind of want to see him in the bullpen. But it's good that you can have this left-handed guy come in. And if he puts it together, it could be really good. But I think it's Ross Stripling's job. I'll agree with you. Um, and Ross Stripling is a very diverse guy. Um, when he was with the Dodgers, he was both a, he started and relieved too. Mm -hmm. So there's some there's some flexibility between these three guys. Um, and I'm I'm old school in a way with um, if we don't sign a guy, I would give it to the veteran too. Um, Ross, that being Ross Stripling. Um, uh, not not a ton on this guy. I did watch him quite a bit last year. Um, yep. He nothing jumped out at me. You know, crazy. He's not a guy who's going to give you tons and tons of innings. The one good thing about him, probably one of the biggest pluses on this pitching staff, is he is great at limiting home runs. Yeah, which is huge. Which isn't yeah. something the Jays really have. No. Um, I do want to add about Ross Stripling. Is he was terrible to start the year last year in April. He got. Hit hard. I think he had a start against the Angels or something where he gave up like seven runs and only got like four outs or something. Um, but there was about a six start stretch there where Ross Stripling actually led the American League in whip. I think it was like a 0.85 whip or something. And there was something ridiculous for a good stretch before Stephen Matz kind of took over. Now, obviously, he didn't hang on to it. He struggled after that and kept going. And then Stephen Matz took over. But you can see glimpses like this out of Ross Stripling. And if you're looking for a fifth starter, I think that's really kind of all you need. 
he's a veteran guy. He's not a sexy name by any choice like that, but I think yeah, throw him in there to start. If he gets hot, he gets hot. He can win you a few ball games. Perfect. I'll give you my little managerial take on that too. Um, if if like you said, if I, I agree, Stripling should have that five spot. But if you're going to face a team with a lot of lefty bats in it, maybe you spot start Baraki too. There's a lot of options. Um, having a guy who can go six, seven innings in your bullpen, that being Baraki, um, mm-hmm. but s- still on Stripling. Um, I, Again, good stretch to talk about, you know, pitchers being flaky in numbers. Yeah, I do want to talk about um, about Nate Pearson. I feel like if we're going to talk about the Toronto Blue Jays, we do need to talk about uh, Nate Pearson and what his upside yeah. could be for this team. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? You said you wanted him in Buffalo as a starting pitcher, right? Uh, I think to start the year, that in all fairness, um, the way this – um, this roster shaping up, I think that would be, you know, the right, the right spot for him to start yeah. the season. Um, obviously playing in spring training, um, you know, we'll talk more about spring training when that comes. If he's going to have some electric numbers, then obviously our opinions are going to change. But at this point right now, I think it's the right place to put him at. So I'm a firm believer in upside. I'm a sucker for upside. And Nate Pearson is a former... He was the best prospect pitching prospect in all of baseball for a season there. His tools are electric. He can throw up to like 102, 103 miles per hour. Jason never had a pitcher that could throw that hard. And so if you play your cards right with, um, with uh, Nate Pearson, he could turn into Justin Verlander. Like he could be that good. Now, he hasn't been. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. Even when he came back last year, the Jays put him in the bullpen and he couldn't throw a strike to save his life. That's going to be the knock on Nate Pearson. If Nate Pearson cannot throw strikes, then he is not going to be a starting pitcher on this team. But if we made Robbie Ray be able to throw strikes after years of not being able to throw strikes, if we can find a way to make that with Nate Pearson, Nate Pearson, he could be better than Barrios. He could be better than um, Kevin Gosman. He could be better than Alec Manoa. Nate Pearson could be absolute dominant. And that would be, you're talking him back and his potential way out. That's an insane upside. Um, and uh, if that were to happen, then you just called it right there. Um, I'm more of a realist when it comes to <laughs> pitching. My expectations for this season, let's just talk this season. If he was to come in um, and start, you know, a few games for us and hold his own in those games, I'd be super happy with that. Um, and if he was to finish the season long out of the pen and still put up some good numbers, that would be great. Mm-hmm. I think uh, the prospect shine has kind of worn off about Nate Pearson too. So not a lot of people are thinking about him in the way uh, they used to, which I think is kind of perfect for this post-hype guy. The guy yeah. that'll come in and everyone be like, hey, remember Nate Pearson? Remember when this guy was supposed to be the guy? So you want to talk about X factors, mark me as Nate Pearson. I'm a Nate Pearson guy. I'm a believer. And I I think there's still a chance. We give him one more year to try to see if he can do it as a starter. If he can't, you throw him in the bullpen. He can be a shutdown eighth inning guy. We'll take that too. I won't hold you to it, Jesse, but I love the enthusiasm towards a still young pitcher who has an absolute um, laser for an arm. All right. You want to get into the bullpen here now? Yeah, we'll dive into the bullpen. Yeah. So the bullpen, it's kind of like the glue, the thing that holds the team together. And as we saw last season when the Jays were having a 91-win season, this team lost a lot of their games because of our bullpen and how bad our bullpen was, particularly early in the year. It's kind of painful looking back if you think our if Tyler Chatwood or Brad Hand or Raphael Dolis or Trent Thornton or any of these guys who came in and just was absolute garbage just pitched one better one saved one more game the Jays are a playoff team and who knows maybe we're World Series champions right so the Jays are really striving to get better in 2022 to have a really good bullpen um, do you want to start with the closer or do you want to run down an overview of who we think all the names are going to be in the bullpen how do you want to do this. Um, well, we can do the overview. I think what we both have Romano as, as our closer, right? I think that's yeah. the, the obvious thing. And I, then I have kind of a setup role um, down for a couple guys. Um, you can, you can um, give your little um, list of who, who's there. And th- then you can kind of, I have all the names here. And then you can kind of pick on who you, who you want to talk about, whatever order. 
Can we talk about the Blue Jays uh, bullpen woes were really the thing that sunk this team last year. I think in 2022, this bullpen, uh, this bullpen is actually going to be better than you think because I'm going to spit down some names for you. Jordan Romano's our closer. He's been our closer for the last two years. He's been, he's been really good. You know, he was hurt last year for the second half. He had a knee injury on his plant leg, and he was still dominant in the second half. So Jordan Romano's our guy, bullpen, closer, lock it in. Tim Meza from the left-hand side was also really good last year. He's got kind of the funky deception coming back from Tommy John surgery. I think he exceeded expectations. He was good last year. Put him in there. Jays just threw some money at Yimi Garcia, who you don't sign a guy to a two-year deal if you're not going to put him in the bullpen, right? So we'll touch on Yimi Garcia a little later, too. They're going to throw him in there. And then we made a trade last year to get Trevor Richards and Adam Simber. Um, and all we had to do was give up uh, Slap Hit and Joe Panic. So that's an absolute win. And the bullpen really turned around once we got those guys in the team. So you got to think they're going to be in this bullpen too. And that that's a list of already a five or six guys who are pretty good. And that doesn't include Julian Merriweather, who was the guy we got for Josh Donaldson, who we've seen how good this guy could be. If um, Nate Pearson ends up in this bullpen, he could be another lights out arm for this team. Uh, Ryan Brucky or Trent Thornton pitching as the long man roller to this team. And there's even some depth in AAA. We saw Taylor Saucedo come in and have some really good innings. We saw Thomas Hatch, um, when he came back from his injury, actually pitched pretty well. Uh, Anthony Castro had some good starts. So there is more depth to this bullpen overall than I think we've seen in the past. And there is a chance that this bullpen could actually be dominant in 2022. Yeah, we need this. Last year, you know, you talk about, you know, the bullpen is the glue of the team. Last year, we really started the year out more like sticky tack um, <laughs> as far as, you know, holding games together. And, you know, we were, you know, if we could have held it together for how many games? I'm not going to talk about what could have been, man. You look right. forward to the future. Um, best case scenario, Romano, Romano's healthy the whole season. And he's going to put up some good numbers in the ninth inning for us. Uh, 23 for 24 in save opportunities last year. I think that's amazing. Chris, Talking percentile, that's that's those are huge numbers, man. Um, and he's a plus strikeout guy too. He's gonna let the defense relax a little bit in the ninth. Not that we need to be sleeping out there, fellas, but um a closer who can who can strike guys out to me is is a is a closer. You'd see the Hoffmans out there, you know, striking guys out, just blowing smoke, not comparing them to Rivera or anything like that. But to me, that's what a closer is. I can just walk onto the field and and finish the game in in, in 13 pitches. So the one thing the Jays have consistently had over the 2010 decade has been having that lights out guy in the back of the pen. Like Jordan Romano stepped in for Ken Giles, who on a bad 2017 and 2018, Ken Giles was kind of a bright spot. He was a really good closer. He was dominant and he was doing good. Before then, we had Roberto Osuna. And before um, we traded him off to Houston for the domestic violence accusations, he was a really good pitcher for this team too, for years, five or six years. So that's the one thing the Jays have always had. And it's been really good with Romano that he can continue doing that in 2022. Yeah, I wouldn't go as far as saying we've always had it. I think there were some bad years where guys, um, Kevin Gregg, DJ Ryan. Um, but in, in this decade, talking yeah. about this decade, we have certainly had um, uh, the back end of our bullpen working for us. <laughs> um, and I, I think you keep, I think you, you know, follow that lead of Osuna and Giles. That, that worked for us. And I think Romano, I think he, he works for us as well. Plus, he's Canadian. From Markham, Ontario. Yeah. So fun yeah. out of Route 4 for Canadian's team. Uh, it's going to be good. He gets high spin on his slider, his fastball, and for how hard he throws, he induces weak contact. I mean, what else could you possibly want from a reliever? And plus, he's got the scary beard, the intimidation factor, yeah. you know? So as we saw Brian Wilson of the Giants have in the early 2010s, like, that just somehow makes you better as a closer. Being a little yeah. freaky, being a little weird, you know? And Romano's got that. Yeah, nothing like a city boy from Mark and having a woodsman beard, <laughs> woodsman beard Jesse. Yeah, so is, I, I guess we should touch on uh, Julian Merriweather a little bit just because, you know, me and my upside, I like to players. We saw Julian Merriweather yeah. um, in the opening series last year against the Yankees look like the best pitcher in baseball, like full stop. He was dot in the corners. He almost threw an immaculate inning. He made Aaron Judge, Aaron Judge, a guy who's a first ballot um, all MLB player this year swung like a freaking sword right through the zone and like that's a 50 home run hitter and julian merriweather just embarrassed him so you want to talk about tools he throws like 98 like he has four pitches like i think julian merriweather if he's good this bullpen's going to be very good and that's just going to help this team going forward i have um him is kind of my second setup option right now to, for an eighth inning guy um, that's 
kind of, again, a lot of these spots, I think Romano, he's going to be the guy who is our ninth inning guy, but I think a lot of the spots are up for grabs. And Merriweather, um, I remember watching the first half of the year, and I thought, I was, I thought, this guy, because I knew we got him in that trade, and I thought, I did not expect that this out of this kid. I mean, he's not, he's not a kid. What is he? 30, 30, 31 now? He's 30, 30 years old. Okay. So he's, he's in the, he's in the prime of his career right now. And I'm hoping we get a pro we don't know what a prime Julian may, may Merriweather looks like, but I hope we see it this year. Yeah. Let's try to roll through the rest of these guys pretty quickly. Um, I just want to touch with Yumi Garcia, the free agent we signed. He's a five pitch pitcher. And um, he started throwing 96 miles per hour, which is like two or three miles per hour faster than he ever threw when he was with the Dodgers. Um, so I really wanted the Jays to try to trade for him at last year's trade deadline. He ended up going to Houston instead. Wasn't as great when he went to Houston, but was still good, still fine. So I'm excited to see him in uh, this team, in this bullpen for 2022. Anything to add on him? Um, no, not much. Another guy that I'm going to have to kind of um, – see see how he does i don't really have an opinion of him um mm -hmm. i think he's a i think he, him and richards to, to me are um kind of same role guys uh and, and not a mop-up kind of way um they're really gonna have to prove themselves uh for me both fairly hard right handers i believe um and kind of the kind of doing the same job i don't really have them you know can they possibly do get some holds in the eighth inning of course um really they're all fighting for a job um between Simber, Merriweather, Richards, Garcia, they're all kind of, you know, who's going to be the eight inning guy with, I don't really know. I yeah. don't, I can't really, I can't really gauge it at this point. Tim Meza was that guy last year. And like, we've already touched on him a little bit, but uh, Tim Meza only got barreled up 3.7% of the time. So like guys were just not hitting the barrel off Tim Meza. So if he continues that. He's going to be a very good piece for this team, especially on the left-hand side. I think it's a good problem to have for this team that they have several options that they could throw into high leverage. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a good problem to have, man. Um, especially like you said with Mesa. Um, he's a, he's a kind of a funny pitcher for me too. Um, he's a kind of a guy who's you know we talk about guys with big upside, and he could have a huge upside. He could also have a very big downside too. Um, Mesa is another one of those pitchers that kind of fall in the same category as Merriweather for me. Okay. Um, they've been tendered a little longer than these guys. I kind of like my, my guys staying in Toronto. The guys I really like and appreciate, you know, are the, not lifers on the Jays, but guys who like to stick around. Mates has been there. He's been yep. there on bad teams. Uh, this could be the best bullpen he's been in, in Toronto. So oh, it'll be yeah, fun for right. him, man. The, hopefully the guys can bounce off each other. Um, you know, maybe tell each other their pitch secrets or whatever mm -hmm. it is pitchers do. I'm not a pitcher, man. Uh, I just hope that they can collectively be good as a unit so is there anything you want to add about some of these guys like david phelps is coming back to this team after only pitching about an inning or two last year because he got hurt pretty early in the season um adam simber just throws like he's yeah. a submarine guy he throws from his heels but he and gets so much gas. deception and he gets so much yeah. deception too it's insane yeah. how like no one could square him up so he's going to be an entertaining look um yeah. You know, if Trent Thornton doesn't start, he'll probably end up in the bullpen here. Ryan Barucki will probably end up in the bullpen. Um, Anthony Kay, who you have starting down in Buffalo, but if we ever need a left-handed guy, he could come up. There's just options on this team, and uh, it's going to be fun for Charlie Montoyo to see how he uses these guys. No argument with that, man. Um, and if, if best case would be to pull uh, Kay up, if, if he's not a guy who can start um, this year, um, injuries – Will happen at some point this year, knock on wood, in really small doses and not for long. Um, and bring K up, you know, see how he does. All right. So I think this is a pretty good overview for today of our starting pitchers. We talked a lot in depth about a lot of these guys and a bunch of our bullpen guys. Um, we'll talk more about prospects and some guys we have in the farm and maybe additional free agents we can have a little later in uh, maybe a different episode next week or something. We'll get there when we get there. But we have to talk about the big news in baseball because – with the lockout going on, there hasn't really been a lot of news. But uh, yesterday, Major League Baseball announced their Hall of Fame ballots. And um, only one person got in. It was uh, David Ortiz, who got in with 78% of the votes. And we know David Ortiz well. He played for the Red Sox for a long, long time. He hit some monster shots against the Blue Jays. You know, very good player. Uh, very tough. I don't know if you want to talk about our ballots first of who we would have voted in if we had our vote, or if you want to talk about what actually did happen and what that means. I'll let you run with that. 
I mean, I'll talk about her ballots. I actually, I don't want to get emotional talking about what actually happened. I think you can, you can go over that. I am very salty. I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we are, I, I should mention, we are now voting in um, players in the Hall of Fame that I would consider to be people's RH, like either childhood heroes or villains or how, however yeah. you want to look at them. And these are guys that we know their game. Um, I, you, you give me a name off that ballot. I'm going to give you a full on report about that dude. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'll, I'll bring you our ballots. And I love the fact that Jesse and I had very similar ballots. We both, we both went for 10 guys. I think that is, um, they're just a no brainer with the names on this list. Yeah. And we, we, we were eight, um, eight for 10 in similarities. Um, so we'll start with, um, we both had Barry Bonds. Yep. Roger Clemens, Todd Helton, David Ortiz, Alex Rodriguez, Scott Rowland, Sammy Sosa, and Billy Wagner. Mm -hmm. um, the only trade-off there was I had voted Aaron, or Andrew Jones, and Jesse went with Canadian Justin Morneau. Um, oh. I had voted um, Kurt Schilling. Uh, Jesse decided to go with Manny Ramirez. Um, and for the question that was asked to me this week, um, in regards to Manny Ramirez's status on my Hall of Fame ballot, I decided he would have been my 11th guy. Um, it was basically between him and Billy Wagner. I feel like as a left-handed relief pitcher, how well that Billy Wagner did, I think he really deserved a shot in Cooperstown. Obviously, he didn't get in. And um, we'll talk about guys who didn't get in. Jesse, why don't you start off this segment with some with some somber um somber remarks yeah so so you and i we both kind of agree that yes we know these people have done steroids yes we know they've um some people would say they've cheated i i don't think we care if you think the hall of fame should be like a museum of or what tells the stories of baseball you have to have barry bonds in there you have to have roger clemens in there you have to have pete rose in there for goodness sake like these players were some of the best players on the field at all times. And if that's what the Hall of Fame is, or it's pretty much what the Hall of Fame is in every other sport. So if the Hall of Fame in baseball is going to be that, then these guys need to be in there. I just think it's it's kind of ridiculous that the baseball writers are trying to do something different and invoking character clause and all these people need to be, you know, perfect humans and all this stuff. And you can't swear at a reporter or you can't do anything like that, I think is ridiculous. And baseball has kind of lived in the past with all their traditions and history and all this stuff and it's just I think it's a little ridiculous I mean you have uh, I'm not going to try and steal your thunder on facts I know you got a lot of those but mm -hmm. you want to talk about uh the most prolific hitter in MLB history and probably the most prolific pitcher uh it's Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens without a doubt um you go for guys who dominated uh, the, their era of baseball. Those two names should just jump off the page uh, for you. You could throw in other names, um, but I'll give you, you know, I'll give you a one up on a reason why Barry Bonds is better than so and so. Um, obviously, the steroid thing. You could, you could, you could see it. Look at a picture. Go Google Barry Bonds, Pittsburgh <laughs> Pirates, and then go Google Barry Bonds, San Francisco Giants. I mean, it's like look at that. You know, a guy like this. And then all of a sudden he's like this and his shoulders are as, as wide as dump trucks, man. Like mm -hmm. he, he was a monster. Um, Clemens a little bit of a, a different story. Um, but you got to remember that these guys were just competing with, with the era. Like everyone was juicing at this point in time. Yeah. Everyone was juicing. The only, the difference with guys, Manny Ramirez juiced at a time where um, it was a little less accepted and same with A-Rod. Um, you know, you, you can file those guys in almost a totally separate category. Um, Barry Bonds was doing it just to keep up. He just happened to be the best at hitting a baseball um, and barreling a ball up, man. Because he, you look at this guy, you know, again, YouTube, Barry Bonds, for those of you who, you know, can just, you know, who form an opinion based off he did steroids. But look at the way he hits a baseball, man. It's the hardest thing to do in sports to hit a baseball. And Barry Bonds was just, just an absolute monster. I mean, I've never seen a guy get intentionally walked with the bases loaded before because <laughs> people didn't want Barry Bonds hitting a home run against them. So, yeah, absolutely. I just Easiest RBI of his career, man. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's just ridiculous that the Hall of Fame doesn't have baseball's all-time hit leader, all-time home run leader, and all time the person who has got the most signing awards in MLB history. So if you're not putting these guys in the Hall of Fame, I get it. You know, they might not have been good people if you think they've cheated the game. Sure. But I think that's a little crazy. And if if 
that's not what we're doing, then I don't know what the Hall of Fame is doing. It's it's a it's a very it's very political, Jesse. Yeah. I mean, just to go like, there's other names. Um, I'd like to you know just say a couple other names. You know, um, who was the other guy? It was Sosa. Sosa was so, another one, yeah. Yeah. Um. So again, not Barry Bonds numbers. Um. But still, um, I think right off the top, I'm gonna guess. Uh, six oh nine home runs. He had over six hundred. I know that. I say I, I I can't I I'm trying to envision the Google page in my head because I do it's something that lives rent free in my head is <laughs> is the all time home runs leaders I'll always know that mm -hmm. um, but yeah just it's it's kind of sad in a way because they were some of baseball's greatest players in what I would call Jesse baseball's greatest era really four players a lot of people say the steroid era saved baseball and that uh, the McGuire I'm sure it did players. man yeah yeah and. And going out and you know what what would have made it better for me like it, even people forget in that race um, that the kid Ken Griffey Jr. actually got hurt that year and had some crazy numbers mm -hmm. to compete with too. I can't pull those numbers off the top, uh, but Ken Griffey Jr. being my favorite player that's a non-J, I know this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. It was just a, it was the time to be a baseball fan. Not saying that it's not now. Now's the time to be a Jays fan. Trust me. But as far as being an over, looking at the sport as an overall with what guys did back then, it was insane. So Riley, I got to ask you, how do you feel about uh, Scott Rowland? Uh, so, guy you've mentioned is one of your favorite guys. He he, he is. Him. I no. Um, <clears throat> I love a five-tool guy yeah. uh, in baseball. I love defense. I love a guy who can hit and hit for power. Obviously, Roland didn't have the big foot speed, but he was a third baseman and a right. big third baseman. He And he was known for, if you want to talk politics, he was known for having a great personality too. He was a good clubhouse guy. Um, he was a, he was a, he, and he was a defensive catalyst. I, I'm sure he made guys he played with better too. Um, and that's And that's hard. Um, he's not a guy who had uh, 500 home runs. Um, he had a pile of gold gloves. And, you know, Hall of Fame worthy stats, really. But I'm not a baseball writer. I can't tell you who goes in and who doesn't. Perhaps, yes, I am biased towards Scott <laughs> Rowland. But, you know, that's, it's, it's part of the game to be passionate about players you like. And, and you know what? We'll, we'll give it to him next year. We'll get we'll give Scott Rowland. Um, we'll get him into Cooperstown next year. Yeah. So sixty three percent of the vote is pretty good. And the good yeah. thing for Scott Rowland is Bonds, Clemens, Sosa, and all them are coming off the ballot. So that's a lot of votes that should probably go Scott Rowland's way. And I think I'm with you. I think next year is Scott Rowland's year that he finally. Yeah. Gets well, uh, you know, as soon as he you know hung up the cleats, you knew it was a matter of time. Uh, one of the most well rounded third baseman of all time, I would say. At least uh, at least guys that I kind of took notice to and, you know, quite, know quite a bit about. Um, as far as, the, as far as other guys, I, my, you know, favorite Dom J first baseman, Todd Helton um, mm -hmm. also gets a vote from, from both you and I, um, and you could call it the course effect for his, you know, overall numbers. But at the end of the day, Todd Helton was a great first baseman. He was a great defender and a great hitter. And he was, if you call Tony Gwen, Mr. Padre, Todd Helton was Mr. Rocky. Yeah, absolutely. He was part of those uh, mid '90s mashers. There, he was really good. Um, I want to move on here. I want to. We're getting pretty close to the end here, and I got a few more points we should touch up on. Yeah. Um, but these are the names that didn't get the five percent vote, so they have fallen off the Hall of Fame ballot. I'll just read them off. If you have anything you want to say about any of them, do that. So, uh, well, Joe I'll, Nathan. I'll... No, you're good, Joe Nathan. Yep. Yeah. yeah, Joe Nathan, Tim Hudson, Tim Lincecum, Justin Morneau, Ryan Howard, and Mark Teixeira are all off the ballot won't be hall of famers unfortunately any thoughts on any of those guys no uh just maybe two right off the bat which is ryan howard had one of the best statistical nl seasons of all time mm -hmm. um he might have had a good follow-up year other than that he's really not a hall of famer um sucks for tax um i know a buddy of yours is a is a real to share fan i was no, too. something <laughs> um a, a great a great switch hitter man 
uh, a plus defender and a guy who was another guy you talk about a corner fought like a, you, you're not gonna, not gonna compare him to Scott Rowland, but he was another four four tool player. You might take away the speed and was a great corner infielder. Yeah. And Tim Lincecum, too, when he was with the Giants in those early 2010 years, it, was there a more fun pitcher in baseball to watch than Tim Lincecum? Just this little no, scrawny no. guy going through with the long hair and just absolutely dominating. Um, absolute, absolute West Coast guy, Tim Lincecum. Good guy. Now, to wrap up our Hall of Fame committee chat, you know, there is still a chance that, like, Bonds, Clemens, and all these guys can get in. There is, like, a Hall of Fame committee um, where it's these 12 guys or whatever on the panel, and they discuss, and they can vote guys in. But I think it might be tough for them to get in because it's full of a lot of older Hall of Famer guys, and those guys tend to be a lot more biased. So if the baseball writers couldn't vote these guys in, I do think it might be tougher for these guys to get in here. But I do think eventually – just through public outcry, these guys are going to be Hall of Famers at some point. It just it might not be till after these guys pass away, which is which is kind of sad. Um, or if they really want to get into the Hall of Fame, they could just buy a ticket. And they can walk through like <laughs> yeah. us, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, um, I don't I don't see first I don't I, maybe Barry Bonds does that. I don't see Schilling or Clemens doing that anytime soon. Yeah. Um one more thing about the Hall of Fame. Uh, in 2023, you want to talk about controversy and scandal. You know who enters the ballot in 2023? Oh, boy. Um, can I get a hint? Um, well, obviously, he's been retired for four years. He, yeah. Uh, he played in New York Mets, San Francisco, and I feel like I'm missing another team. Um, he was an outfielder. Um, oh, man. It's uh, not Beltron, is it's it? It's Carlos Beltron, who's going to be oh. on the 2023 ballot. Who, um, wow. if, if you know about the sign stealing scandal that the Houston Astros mm -hmm. had in 2018, wow. Carlos Beltron was like the ringleader in that. So his name is up for Hall of Fame ballots in 2023. So I'm sure we'll get to talk about that. And uh, that's going to be yeah. a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, another, again, one thing to add I like a switch hitter. Um, obviously, an outfielder, not an infielder. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're to look at the all-time switch hitter numbers, you're going to see Teixeira, Chipper Jones, and you'll also see, you know, and Mickey, Mickey, Mickey Mantle too. Yes. But more recent, you'll see you'll see Beltron on those lists for mm -hmm. sure. So it'll be an interesting conversation to have when 2023 rolls around. Um, yep. All right, so we're almost done. But before we escape you off here, we got to do some trivia, Riley. Are you ready? Yeah, man. Uh, one for one coming yeah. in here. I'm batting a batting a thousand, buddy. <laughs> Perfect. Love to see it. Only downhill from here, unfortunately. Eh? Yeah, that's right, man. Can't get her back past this point. And again, if you guys are watching on YouTube, feel free to leave an answer in the comments here. We love the interaction that we got on our first episode here of, uh, of all the guesses that we got. Um, I figured with this answer, we're going to combine, or this question, we're going to combine the Hall of Fame along with some Toronto Blue Jays. So I'm not going to ask you a simple one, like uh, what year did Roberto Alomar get elected or, you know, what number is Roy Halladay wearing? Yeah. The question I'm going to ask you today is um, how many former Toronto Blue Jays or players that have played for the Blue Jays at least one point in their career are currently in the Hall of Fame? And any bonus oh. points? I'll give you bonus points if you can name any of them. So, uh, well, we'll start with Frank Thomas. Frank Thomas that, is one of them, yeah. That's one of them. Next, holy done. cow, holy <laughs> cow, man, what a question. Yeah. Um, Dave Winfield is in the Hall of Fame, I you're, know that. You're two for two, bud. I, I don't think Joe Carter's in the Hall of Fame, nah, sadly. That's, that's strike one. He is in the Hall of Fame. No, 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 he's not. No, I said, I, I no, I was saying not Joe Carter. Okay, I, yeah. I, I, you can read, you can, you can back the truck and look at the tape. <laughs> I didn't say, I didn't say Joe Carter is in the Hall of Fame. Um, Halliday, obviously. Yep. But, um, you know, wow, that's a real, that's a thinking man's question right yeah. there. How, if you had to put a number on it, how many do you think there are? So we, we came into the league in 1977, mm -hmm. and we've just played the 2021 year. How many Blue Jays or how many players have gone through the Toronto organization that are currently in the Hall of Fame? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've already named uh, three of them. I, right? and there's then four gotta, there's, there's, I know there's got to be there's got to be a few more, man. There was some there was some good players. I'm gonna say nine. I'm gonna okay. say nine. So you guys watching on YouTube, type in your answers, see what you think. Uh, you can tweet us your answers too. Um, write it down. We'll reveal the answers out on next week. It's a good thinker though, and I think it's going to yeah. – some names on this list are going to be interesting. And you're not telling me the answer to this after we're done <laughs> filming here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit on this, man, and I might, <laughs> okay, change, great. 
I, I got too much going on up here to think straight about that, but that is that is a hell of a question, Jesse right. Burrell. So, so maybe at the start of next episode, then I'll uh, re trivia again and see if you can mm. uh, figure it out. Um, yeah. But I think that'll do it for our episode here today. Riley, you have any closing thoughts? No. Uh, again, it was a lot. It's This is a tough episode. This might have been my least favorite episode to do. Um, <laughs> not a pitching guy, eh? <laughs> I'm not really a pitching guy. I'll just, I, I won't blow smoke at you guys. You know, I'm not a guy who knows a ton about pitching. You know, bear with me through the year. Um, and it, it's a, not a good time to be, a, um, you know, basically an alumni baseball guy who loved to watch <laughs> players in the steroid era who didn't get in right. um I, and i'll leave it at that um looking looking forward to um next episode looking forward to future episodes again uh fun and for for us to do our research too we love this kind of stuff and if, again if there's anything you guys want us to talk about blue jays baseball related we'd love to do it yeah, you want to ask about Riley's setup or Riley's haircut or anything, you know, we can we can talk about all that here on the show. So make yep, sure you right. like and subscribe, leave a comment below. Um, we don't know what we're going to talk about next week. Maybe we'll talk prospects. Maybe we'll talk off-season moves. I don't know. The world is wide open in Blue Jays land, so we can uh, figure all that stuff out. Uh, make sure you check out our friends over at Leafs and Lads. Uh, Leafs just pulled a tough win in a shootout against the Ducks yesterday. And there's a lot of big trade rumors as we get closer to the trade deadline for the Maple Leafs. So Isaac, Mark, and Din over there have you covered. Make sure you follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can send us an email at budsandbluejays at hotmail.com. And yeah, if you have any questions or comments or something you want to hear, let us know. We'll be all ears for it. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>